our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to the Palo Alto studios of the Cube. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. We're here with a special power panel on industrial IoT, also known as IIoT, industrial IoT, and cybersecurity, with the theme being apocalypse now or later. When will the, the rug be pulled out from everyone? When do people take, have to make a move on making sure that the network and security are all teed up and all locked down as IoT increases the surface area of networks, industrial IoT, where critical equipment or infrastructure is being run for businesses. Got a great panel here, we got Gabe Lowy, who's the founder and CEO of Tectonic Advisors and author of an upcoming research paper on this particular topic. Brian Skeen, Vice President of Product Development at Tempered Networks, and Greg Ness, the CMO, who happened to be available to join us from Tempered Networks as well. Guys, thanks for spending the time to come on this power panel. Great to be here. So convergence is a theme we've heard every wave of innovation, the convergence of this, convergence of networks and apps. Now more than ever, there's a, there's a confluence of multiple waves of convergence happening. You're seeing it right now, infrastructure turned into cloud, big data turned into machine learning and AI. You got future infrastructure like blockchain around the corner, but in the middle of all this is security, data, networking. This is kind of the, the, the beginning of a cloud 2.0 dynamic where Pure cloud is great for computed network. You're native born in the cloud, you scale it up, it's great. Still got challenges, but if you're a large company and you want to actually operate cloud scale, anything, and have instrumentation, internet of things, devices, sensors, in factories, in plants, in cars, the game is changing. If it's connected to the network, it's got power and connectivity, a terrorist, a hacker, a digital terrorist can come in and do all kinds of damage. This is the topic. So, so great. We talked about this panel. What's the motivation for this? What's your thoughts? Well, it occurred to us that, you know, as you look at all the connectivity that's, you know, underway, right? Billions of devices being connected. Um, the level of scale, complexity, and the porosity of what's being connected is just really incomprehensible um, to the people that develop the internet. And it's raising a lot of issues all around, basically the number of devices uh, the inability to protect and secure and update those devices, and the sheer amount of money and effort that would be have to be applied uh, to protect them is beyond the scope of current IT security staff. Um, so, so, Gabe, I want IT is not ready. IT right, certainly, we, we you know you and I talk about this all the time, but you know yeah. I love the I love the the hype and digital transformation. It's going to save the world. Gabe, talk about the dynamics because the, the title of this uh, panel, really the subtitle is Apocalypse Now or Later. And this seems to be the modus operandi is that, you know, you know what has to hit the fan before any action is taken. You see Capital One, there isn't a day going by where there's some major breach, major hack, it's a firewall for Capital One, going to an open S3 bucket from some girl who's bragging about it on Twitter, it wasn't really a serious hacker. Then you got adversaries that are organized, whether it's state sponsored and or real money making underbelly activities happening. You know, there are digital terrorists out there. There are digital thieves. The surface area with IOT is absolutely opened up. We kind of know that, but IO, industrial IOT, they're talking about industrial equipment, industrial activities, whether it's critical infrastructure or plant and equipment for companies. This is a huge digital problem. What's your take? What's your thesis? Yes, it is. And building on what Greg said, there's an interesting gap um, from both sides. The first is that this industrial equipment or critical infrastructure, some of it goes back 20, 25 years. It was not architected to be connected to the internet, but yet with this digital transformation that you alluded to, companies want to find ways of getting that data, putting it into various analytics engines to improve cost efficiencies or decision outcomes. But how do you do that with a lot of equipment out there that runs on different operating systems and really was not built for internet connections? The other side of the gap is that the traditional IT security technologies, firewalls, intrusion protection, VPNs, they in turn were not built or architected 
to secure this IIoT infrastructure. And that gap creates the vulnerability that opens the door for cyber criminals to come in or state-sponsored cyber attackers to come in and do some serious damage. Brian, I want you to weigh in here. You're, you're, you're a network guy, you've been around the block, you've seen the networks evolve. I mean, the primitives were, were clear. The building blocks of the internet were, the DNS ran, most of it, that's most of what the internet right now, whether you're talking about from a marketing to, to routing, it's all DNS based, there's IP addresses as well under that. So you got you got the IP address, you got DNS. What else is there? What 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 can be done? Why isn't these problems being solved by traditional firewalls and traditional players out there? Is it just the limitations of the infrastructure? Or is there just more cultural DNA <laughs> that could evolve, evolve? What's your take on this? Yeah, uh, the way I think about this is that the internet that we know and we use has mostly been built for human beings. I mean, it's been built for humans to use it. Um, humans have discriminating taste. Uh, they decide what to click on. For the most part, they are skeptical. They learn through uh, trial and error, you know, what happens if they visit something. When people try to fool other people or machines or uh, uh, you know, you get a web page and it's got something misleading, you learn that, you don't click on that anymore. And the infrastructure we have today is built to help people um, avoid these problems as well as drop their drop packets when they can detect that something is just absolutely wrong. Uh, but machines, they don't know any of that. They're not discriminating. They're, they've been built uh, to, if they're going to be on a network, to trust everything that's talking to them and to send data and assume that the other side is also trusting them and just acting on the data. So it's just a fundamentally different problem. And, uh, you know, what traditionally those machine networks have had air gaps. They've been air gapped away from any other kind of data or uh, potential threat. And those air gaps are gone. So and air gaps were supposed to save us, weren't they? but they're not, are they? Well, they kept us going for, as Gabe alluded to, 20, 25 years. Those machines have been operating, operating critical infrastructure. But, you know, with uh, digitalization, with the opportunities uh, to look at that data in the cloud and do machine learning. And by the way, the machine learning is not being done in the cloud just for scale. So the, the problem of getting the data from the machines or the things up into the cloud is a huge issue. And if there was an air gap between, say, a cloud and the thing, we might we might be somewhere. So a lot of incompatible architectures relative to what everyone's doing with cloud and say hybrid or multi-cloud. Gabe, you know, you you know the, the two worlds of uh, information technology or IT people and operational technology people that tend to run the IoT world, you know, you hear sensors, you know, factory floors to whatever um, called OT people, operational technologies. I've always said that's a train wreck between those two cultures. I mean, they all, they kind of don't like each other, right? Like you got uh, you know, IT guys, they're stacking and racking equipment. OT guys, stay out of my world. I run proprietary stacks, it's locked down. Pretty locked down from a security standpoint. IT pretty promiscuous just in the nature of it. As those two worlds collide, is that the thesis of the catastrophe model? Is you seeing that, that world coming together? What's your thoughts on this? That, yes, good question. That world has to come together. And uh, I'll give you an analogy to this. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, a lot of people were doubtful that DevOps would ever take off because development guys really didn't like operations guys, they didn't like dealing with them. Here we are 10 years or so later uh, and everyone's pretty much adopted it and they're seeing the benefits of it. This. OT, IT convergence takes it to a much higher level because the stakes are so much higher because a cyber attack can cause catastrophic damage. And as a result, these two teams are not only going to have to work together in harmony, but they're going to have to learn each other's stacks. In the case of the, uh, the um, OT guys, it's the traditional OSI networking stack for IT uh, networks. And for the IT guys, 
they're going to have to learn the Purdue model, which is the model that's principally used in architecting these OT systems. And unless these two teams do work together, um, the vulnerabilities and probabilities for a catastrophic event uh, increase significantly. That's a great example. DevOps was poo-pooed on early on. I mean, Greg, we were back in 2008 riffing on this. Now it's mainstream. Agility's come from it, the lean startup, all kinds of cool things people are talking about. We love cloud, great. Now when you bring the OT world together and IT world together, Gabe, what is the benefit? What's the key uh, um, uh, ethos around operating technology and IT guys coming up? Because you know, DevOps would simply abstract away the complexity so developers don't have to do configuration and management for all that provisioning stuff and still have the reliability. They call the infrastructure as code. So DevOps was infrastructure as code. What's the ethos of the two worlds coming together on IT and OT? I, I, th I think the, the ethos is uh, at a very high level it's risk management uh, because the stakes are so high uh, that the types of losses that can be incurred, uh, you know, you mentioned Capital One at the top of the program. Yes, those are financial losses, but imagine if the losses resulted in thousands or tens of thousands of people getting infected or perhaps dying. So. The need for these two teams to work together is absolutely critical. Uh, and so uh, I'd say the key strategic approach to this, um, both from the IT and the OT side, is to go into it, uh, into strategy or cyber strategy with the premise that the company has already been compromised. And so that starts to get your thinking away from legacy types of technologies that were not architected to prevent these new threats or defend against them. Uh, and now these teams have to start working together from a totally different standpoint uh, to try and prevent the risks of those catastrophic losses. Greg, I want to get your thoughts. You've been in the IT business for a long time. You've been uh, an, uh, a major player in it, uh, historian as well as, as, as us in IT. Uh, what do you see this contrast between the two cultures of IT and OT? Because you got to lock down these networks. You got to have the, 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 the teamwork between the two because the service area with IOT and industrial IOT is so massive, it's so complicated, yet it's an opportunity at the same time it's an exposure. I mean, just people working at home in IT. I mean, the home is a great place to target people because all you got to do is get that light bulb from Nest and you're at a fully threaded processor. You can run malware and get all the passwords and the person working at home. So again, from home to industrial, where does IT even have the chops to get there? Uh, not the way they're architected today around the TCP IP stack. And, and that's the challenge, right? So from the nineties to this era, you know, whether it's the mainframes to the networks to the internet to the enterprise web, et cetera. Compared to this, we've had relatively incremental change. As surprising as that sounds, you know, devices being added and every year, you know, every other year, every three years, people are upgrading those endpoints, they're adding more sophisticated security. But this world that you referred to, right, the world's in collision, um, was not evolving at all in parallel. So you've got devices with no security in mind, they're being connected. And, you know, calling it the industrial internet of things almost, you know, underwhelms what the risk is. It should be the internet of places or, or spaces because with these devices come control, control of the factory, the hospital, et cetera. And you think back, you know, you asked me about a historical perspective. You, you don't have to go back very far when the Russians were attacking Ukraine, you know, want to cry, not pet you. You know, they spread all over the place in a matter of weeks. UK hospitals were running on carbon paper, postponing procedures. Maersk shipping had their shipping, they lost control of their ships at sea. And now we've got VX Works coming along saying, up, oh, you know, you're gonna have to update that because um, there's some serious vulnerabilities here. VX Works is deployed across billions of devices. So I don't think historically yeah. There's really a precedent. I mean, look, if, if you if you want to, you know, tap into our common interest of military history, we don't even have the semblance of a Maginot line here, you know, and that was a pretty imperfect uh, protection scheme. I mean, the the opportunity to, to infect governments, take them down with misinformation, 
to actually harming people, say through hospital hacks, for instance. You know, people could, our lives are at danger. And, and there's also other threats. I mean, you mentioned, you know, places, devices. It takes one device to be penetrated at home or at work. Yeah. I saw an article um, came across my desk. I saw IBM did some research. The, this concept of war shipping, um, where hackers ship their exploits directly on devi Wi-Fi devices. So people, you know, get these devices. Hey, free, uh, you know, Nest light bulb or whatever's going on. They they install in their home. Oh, it's got I got free Wi-Fi router. Uh, uh it's got it's got built-in malware. Uh, it's just got Wi-Fi connectivity. So again, the, the exploits are getting more complicated. Brian, the network has to be smart. At the end of the day, this cloud 2.0 theme is beyond compute and storage. Networking and security are two underdeveloped areas that need to evolve very quickly to solve these problems. What's your take on this? Well, my take on that is that we're, it, our approach is that the network has to be so smart that it can watch everything and understand what's good and bad, then we're in. So we're, we're going to need to also combine watching packets, the traditional methods, the packet inspection with divide and conquer. Frankly, it's the, the comment I said before that the air gap is gone for OP. I think we need to figure out a way to divide up uh, these, you know, networks of things and give them clean networks if possible and try to segment them away from the networks that the rest of the things are on. So, um, you know, it, we don't have enough computing power, we don't have enough memory and resources, but that's not really just it. We just don't understand what is good traffic versus bad traffic. I mean. We talk about day zero attack, um, and we talk about you know trying to chase that down with signatures, and you know the you can inspect things, you can watch transactions. Um, people say AI uh, is machine learning, but machine learning means learning good and bad from people. And, How do companies fix yeah. this? What, what what's What's the answer to all this? Or is there one? Or it's just going to take catastrophic yeah. loss to wake people up? Well, it better, we, we can't react to the problem. That's one thing that we all can probably, we all know that if we wait for the catastrophe and then we try to react to that and solve it, that it's already gone. It's too late. I mean, this is a geometric expansion in complexity of the problem. Uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think that there's going to be several uh, things that need to be done. One is keep inspecting the traffic, but another one is, again, segmenting things that should be talking to each other away from things that they should not be talking to and trying to control uh, the peers in the network for things. And, you know, that, I don't know, Greg, something you said reminded me, um, fundamentally with networking with TCPIP, we're using the IP address to mean the location. Greg was talking about places. So it, we're talking about the location of something and the identity of that thing. And most of our security policies are spelled out in terms of something, an IP address, that is not under our control. I mean, the network has become so complex as it has grown with NAS proxies, you know, um, motion, mobility, things are moving. Um, a lot of this wasn't foreseen. So Gabe and, and Craig, so do we have to build new software, a new naming system? Do we have to kind of level up and put an abstraction layer on top of the existing systems? What's the answer? The answer is a layered approach because to try and do a complete rebuild or retrofit particularly with different operating systems, different versions, incompatible systems, billions of devices, uh, and, and uh, various types of security um, solutions that were not built for this, that's not a practical solution. Uh, so you've really got to go with an overlay strategy. Um, people are always going to be the vulnerability. They'll fall for phishing attacks. That's why the strategy is that we're already compromised. So if the attacker is already in our network, how do we contain them from doing serious damage? So one strategy for this is micro-segmentation, 
which is a much more granular approach to prevent that lateral movement once the attacker is inside the network. And then when you when you go from there, um, you can pair that with host identity protocol, which has been around for a while, but that was architected specifically to address the networking and security requirements for IIoT environments, because it addresses that gap that we were talking about uh, between traditional security solutions that lack this functionality, and it only allows whitelisted communications between hosts or devices that are already approved and only approved to communicate with one another. So you can effectively do a lockdown even if the attacker is already inside your network. I want to get back to some of the uh, criteria on this and I want to also put a plug in for the Tectonic Advisors report that's coming out that you are the author of. It's called Securing Critical Infrastructure Against Cyber Attacks. Um, I read it, the great paper. It was a line that I read, and I want to get your thoughts. I'm going to read it out loud. I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Gabe, or anyone else who wants to chime in. It says, I, industrial IoT cybersecurity is beyond the scope of traditional firewall and VPN solution, solutions, which struggle to keep up with the scale and variety of modern attacks. What do you mean by that? What, give an example, describe, what, what, tell me what you mean by that sentence, and what, what examples can you give? Well, I'd say the most important thing is that firewalls were initially built uh, to, def to protect what we call north-south traffic. In other words, um, traffic that's coming in from the internet into the organization and back out. But now with network expansion, cloud adoption, and more and more uh, devices, uh, industrial devices being connected, uh, these firewalls cannot defend against that. They simply were not architected for it. Uh, they cannot scale to those proportions. And even if you're using software only versions, those aren't effective either because they do not protect against east-west or in other words, lateral traffic. So if you're an organization moving IIoT data from your OT systems across your network into IP analytics, systems or software, um, that's lateral movement. Your firewall is traditional firewall, just not going to be able to handle that and protect against it. So in simple terms, we need a new overlay, not to say that firewalls are going away anytime soon, they can still protect north-south traffic, but we need a new type of overlay that can protect, that can protect this type of traffic Micro segmentation is the strategy to do that and using host identity protocol or HIP protocol is what fills that gap that, uh, that the traditional uh, security tools were not uh, designed to protect against. Greg, I want you to weigh in on this because um, you know, you, you're in this business now, but you, you, know, you know the IT world. The criticality of what he just said is super critical to the nature of business, you know, the, the catastrophic examples there, but IT does not move that fast. You know IT, IT is like molasses. I mean, they, they move right. slow. What is going to light a fire under IT to get them to be sensitive? I mean, obviously it's pretty obvious. That, can they get there? Do they have to restructure? What has to happen in the IT world? Because, you know, it is a catastrophic, you know, end, end game here if they don't nail down this traffic protection. Well, part of the, you know, Part of it is education because we've been, you know, we've seen wave and wave of incremental innovation in the network. And, you know, when it happened, it seemed so big. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it was such a big, it, it produced huge market cap growth with a lot of companies, you know, play this guessing game of, you know, who is really connecting to the network. And uh, it's evolved, you know, kind of gradually relative to this big leap we have ahead of us. And IT is going to have to become aware that IIoT is a fundamentally different uh, problem and challenge to solve. Well, and it's I going to require new thinking, new purpose built, like Gabe said, approaches. Um, anything like the traditional firewall segmentation is just not going to address, you know, what we talked about, right? The scale issues, the resilience, right? So yeah. some of these devices, you don't want them off 
for one or two percent of the time and the implications of them it's it's much more serious so yeah. i think that you know more types of you know attacks are inevitable and they're going to be even more catastrophic and and you were all aware that not patch and want to cry you know raised a lot of eyebrows just for how quick it spread and the damage it caused and we've just seen vx works vulnerabilities being announced yeah, so worms are still popular worms are still we need popular to prepare now malware What's worms that? Malware and worms are still popular. Um, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a problem. Well guys, thanks so much for spending the time on this panel. I'll give you the final word here, you guys. Share um, what you think is going to happen over the next 24 months, 12 months. Is it going to take catastrophic failure? Is it gonna, what's going to happen in your mind? What's going to end up being the trajectory over the next, you know, say year? Gabe, uh, well, okay. unfortunately, right. sometimes, sometimes it might take a catastrophic event uh, to get things moving, hopefully not. Uh, but I think there's growing recognition as IIoT uh, is is growing that they need new ways to secure this movement of data between OT and IT. And in order to facilitate that securing of data, you're going to have to have that OT and IT convergence occur because the risk as, as you sort of alluded to earlier, John, we hear in the headlines about massive data breaches and all this data that's stolen. But the risk in IIoT is not only the exfiltration of the data. The risk is that the attacker has the capacity to take over the infrastructure. And if that happens in a hospital, if it happens with um, a water treatment facility or a government type of defense installation, uh, the outcomes can be disastrous. So the first thing that has to happen is OTIT convergence. Second, they have to start thinking strategically from a standpoint that they have already been breached. And so that changes their viewpoint about the technologies that they have to deploy and where they have to move to, to efficiently get to what I call the itties. And that's the, you still need the availability You've got to have visibility into this traffic. You need reliability of this network. Obviously it's got to be at scale. It's got to be manageable and you need security. Well, and we'd like to have you on again, um, Gabe, because we've talked about this from a national security perspective. Not only the hackers potentially risking the business risk there, there's a national security overlay because, you know, if a government's attacking our businesses, that's like showing up on the shores of our country it's the government's job to protect the freedoms and safety of the citizens. That includes companies. So why are companies defending themselves with all this capability? What's the role of government in all this? That's a very important, I think, a longer conversation. So let's pick that one up, a separate one. My favorite topic these days, critical and, infrastructure, and John, it's just business. It's, it's the, the, um, the grid, it's the plants that run our country. And John, what I'd like to add to that is I was talking to a friend of mine who's a CIO down here in California yesterday, and we were talking about the ransomware, right? That was taking down all these cities. And, you know, he goes, well, the difference between what you guys are talking about and that is that you can back up your IT systems, right? Into the cloud. And that's a growing business to kind of protect and then replicate game over. And he goes, can you back up a hospital? Can you back up a manufacturing plant? Can you back up a fleet of ships? You know, uh, can you back up a you know control center? Um, not really. When you lose physical control, it's game over. And uh, people, I think that really needs to sink in. And that was, I think, when Gabe's paper, when I first read it, that's what really struck me about it. Um, this is a different ballgame. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's many points. There's the technical point there, and there's also the societal point of you imagine um, things being taken over by hackers that are physically could harm people. And that's again, yeah. uh, the societal side. Yeah. Technically, the incompatible architectures is coming home to roost now because there's the problem right there. That's the collision that's happened. I think and a lot of education it needs to happen fast. Um, Gabe, thanks for writing that paper, critical infrastructure against cyber tech, securing it. Brian, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. You want to say, you get the final word, Brian, go ahead. Your thoughts, next Great. 12 months. <laughs> um, I think that it, this, it's our, Future, our secure future depends on OT and IT coming together and a lot of education 
um, a lot of change. I don't think we're going to get there. I think that what's going to happen in the next 24 months is that, uh, you know, there are lots of innovative teams and companies and people working on this, and what we need to do is lay down infrastructure that allows OT and IT to keep operating um, and not have to do a forklift upgrade of everything that they do, their processes, um, or teach the things how to protect themselves. And again, I'm going to go back to air gap the network, make a logical air gap. If you imagine driverless cars driving around, they're not going to, you know, imagine them sharing the same network that we're using to do Snapchat and look at, at cities, um, you know, kittens on the internet and looking at Facebook. Um, we're not going to want that. So we need to like, figure out a way, separate the location of a thing from the identity, create policies in terms of the identity, manage that at a new layer, and do it in such a way that doesn't change IT. That's the, to me, that's the key, because as we said here, IT doesn't move that fast, they can't. It's not a matter of willpower, it's a matter of momentum and inertia. Well, we don't, well I so, think the forcing function on this is going to be a catastrophic event, the title of this, subtitle of this panel, Apocalypse Now or Later, and you know, my opinion, Greg's been, you know, I'm on this Jedi Department of Defense story. I believe this is one of the most important stories in the technology industry in a long, long time. It really yep. highlights the, the confluence and convergence of two differently designed infrastructure technologies that have to, in a very short time, be re, re, replatformed at high speed <laughs> in a very fast, short time frame because the stakes are so high. So guys, thanks so much for spending the time Thank here you. on this power panel, IIoT, industrial IoT and cybersecurity. Apocalypse now or later, something's going to have to happen. It has to happen fast. Gabe, Brian, Greg, thanks for taking the time. This is a CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, Power Panel. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.